Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the final guest panel discussion of the three days here at the Access Industry Forum Knowledge Base. The last, the last discussion of the day um, is probably one of the most important discussion panels that we have over the whole three days and it continues on quite strongly from where we started last year with the Holy Grail. The intention of the Holy Grail is an opportunity for all effectively what I would call the big guns of the safety and health industry organisations to all sit together on one important panel here to discuss and address the issue of how we can rapidly emit working at height incidents and accidents forever from the workplace. Basically the thought process is with all these great minds around the table we should be able to, if we can't do it, who else is going to be able to do it? So. Let me quickly run you through the guest panellists that we have here on the panel today. Starting at, at the very end of the table, we have Peter Bennett, um, Managing Director of PASMA and Chairman of the Access Industry Forum. Next to Peter, we have Neil Stone, Director of Policy and Affairs for the British Safety Council. Next to Neil, we have Barry Holt, Director of the International Institute for Risk and Safety Management. I have to remember all my acronyms with all these things. Following that, we have Declan Gibney, from, who's Vice President of IOSH. And finally here, we have Roger Bibbins, Health and Safety Advisor for ROSPA. Thank you all for joining us again today on the panel, gents. Um, I thought, as basically the title of this is on the trail of the Holy Grail, 12 months on. It's been 12 months since we first had our, our first meeting here last year. I thought it might be interesting just to all of us go down the line and individually from our, each of our organisations point of view elaborate to the audience exactly what each of the organisations have done with regards to the development of uh, the reduction of working at high incidents and accidents. So um, Roger if I could start with you maybe from Rusper's point of view. Okay. Um, we haven't discovered the holy grail. Um, but we have been working uh, away in quite a number of ways on uh, safety of working at height. Obviously a big part of Rosper's work is what we deliver through our training um, and also what we extract in good practice from our health and safety awards. And we're here this week making a record number of awards, particularly in the construction sector where there is an enormous amount of good practice and uh, part of our challenge this year as in previous years is to mine the good practice out of these top award winners so that's a big part of our um, continuing work. As I say that we know there's no silver bullet to solve this problem but there are some silver threads and one of the silver threads we believe that's particularly particularly relevant in uh, preventing falls from height is the whole question of team leadership because we put effort into reminding directors and senior managers that they must lead health and safety management we put effort into re-engineering worker engagement but the bit in the middle which is absolutely crucial and which determines um, uh, performance whether it's of lone workers or of uh, close teams is the role of the team leader or the supervisor in providing leadership. So this is an area we think in falls prevention particularly we need to uh, pay attention. One of the things that I'm exploring at the moment and it's uh, watch this space is to see and this again stems from lessons which have emerged from um, award-winning companies is to see if we can apply some of the principles of crew resource management and bridge resource management, these are techniques applied, you know, in the civil aviation and maritime area about decision making and safety critical teams um, working together with common situational awareness and joint decision making, whether we can apply some of these techniques in the behavioural safety field. As um, some of you may know, I've been particularly critical of some of the more, in quotes, traditional approaches to behavioural safety, but I think that if we were to really focus down onto uh, some of these more sophisticated techniques, we could deliver a lot more. But I, I would come back to the, the question of team leadership. The thing we need to do with team leaders 
is to get them to understand in a much more sophisticated way about why falls from height occur and where the, how the chain of fault arises and where it can be interrupted. And this is, as I say, moving well beyond the old-fashioned ABC approach to behavioural safety and getting them involved in learning from accidents and incidents and also getting them to learn those vital soft skills which are necessary to keep teams working safely. So, as ever, I think the solutions here are not technical. They're about team dynamics, they're about leadership, they're about worker involvement, and we've got to um, help those who are struggling with these issues to see what the very best in the industry are achieving. Right. Thanks, Roger. Declan, moving on to you, if I may. Um, equally, we have yet to find the holy grail and the solution um, in IOSH, um, no less so than ROSPA, but where we've been actively working over the past 12 months in IOSH have been in, I suppose, the context of the organisation and what it can do as an organisation and equally what our members are doing as individuals. Um, the organisation itself has uh, two active campaigns at the moment, one called Get the Best, Be the Best, which endeavours to alert people to the issue of competencies in recruiting health and safety advisors or uh, practitioners at appropriate levels of their organisation, which in turn helps them achieve the highest possible standard of safety management. The other campaign at the moment is Life Savings, which is a very much an active campaign around promoting the cost-benefit analysis of managing health and safety properly using real-life examples of where companies have achieved tangible savings through effective management of health and safety. And these types of campaigns are important in getting the message out that safety can be managed and there are ways and means of doing that and there are benefits in doing that. Over the past 12 months, IOSH is also, uh, as part of the Lofsted report and that process, we um, had two meetings with Professor Lofsted as part of the review process and recently published a paper on the government response to the Lofsted report commenting on the, uh, the various elements of that, um, including the, the, the recommendations or suggestions by the Professor in relation to the workers' height regulations and where the underlying issue for the report in terms of workers' height regulations seems to be that there are no fundamental issues about the legislation itself uh, being fit for purpose. The issue is its understanding and its application into the working environment, which is again where the competencies of practitioners and advisors come to the forefront. IOSH has also been involved in the Olympic Delivery Authority's learning legacy and uh, contributed to the Health and Safety Steering Group in relation to uh, one particular micro-project which was lowering MUPs in an emergency situation. Um, I suppose as a final point, our members, our 40,000 or so members across the world, are constantly working as advisors and as uh, practitioners to assist in the implement, impl implementation of best practice in relation to managing work at height issues. Brilliant. Thanks, Declan. Barry, moving on to yourself. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been sort of active in, and it's very closely related to what Roger was talking about, is that um, we need, if we're going to achieve any significant uh, improvement, not just in uh, working at height, but in other sort of persistent problems, is actually the culture of the organisation. And we've been doing um, quite a bit of work with Manchester Business School. Um, we've got two research projects underway which are related to the safety culture. And in particular, we've been doing work related to that on leadership. But Roger was talking about team leaders. Um, We've actually, we're looking in a slightly different direction in that we've identified that health and safety professionals um, who are really the focal point within organisations um, have to have the ability to lead and not just lead the, um, the people who are the employees. They're the ones who actually have to um, advise, they have to convince senior management 
of the value of putting this extra effort into areas like working at height. And so um, we've actually developed a um, leadership program which basically equips them to speak the same language that employers speak and to hopefully get employers to understand the language that safety professionals um, speak. Um, more specifically, um, we've been quite actively engaged in the, with the EU Occupational Safety and Health Agency in their um, Healthy Workplace campaign. And the last one was actually based on uh, safe maintenance. And we actually put on some, a number of um, seminars related to that and including uh, sessions on uh, working at height. Um, and we've also signed up for the partnership with the new campaign, which is on working together for risk prevention. And this brings together a number of the issues that we've talked about, the leadership, and actually getting employee involvement. And we're, what we're actually doing is planning our own campaign relating to that. And hopefully we will be um, relating some uh, working at height uh, efforts in with that. Brilliant. Thanks, Barry. Neil, if I can share. <clears throat> Thank you, Neil. If you look at the HSE statistics in terms of the top 10 sectors that have high, highest incident of uh, injuries resulting from slips, trips, and falls, uh, our members in those sectors account for two thirds of our membership. We're particularly strong at the British Safety Council in the manufacturing transport, distribution, utility and construction sectors. There's something going on. Uh, I, don't know, I don't think it helps one moment us to um, identify uh, where the Holy Grail is, if it exists. Uh, the reality is that uh, there's been massive improvements uh, in the performance of the construction industry over the last 10 years, before the 2005 regulations. But the statistics are clear. And that is that there's sectors other than construction that have got serious problems to deal with when it comes to falls and heights. Transport and distribution and utilities, among others. There's a challenge that we all face in terms of creating a greater awareness. So, um, I love talking to our member organisations. You talk to the member organisations in construction and I tell you very, very clearly that what we see now in terms of the management of risks relating to falls from heights is unrecognisable from what went on 15 years ago. And that's a tremendous achievement. There's still examples, though, of where, you've all seen it, of where small refurb projects just take risks uh, by the scruff of the neck, kick them into touch and pretend they don't exist. Yeah, there's things that we see that cause us concern. I'm sure that the same goes with you. And I was speaking to Neil about it. I don't know if you remember, about three or four weeks ago, there was that scaffold collapse in Ballam High Road. Uh, and it was quite a serious collapse. The reason why possibly it didn't grab the headlines that it should have done was that it happened about two or three o'clock in the morning. There were no cars at the time driving by and there were no uh, pedestrians using the pavement. That could have resulted in fatalities. And we have to learn from that. So a lot of the work that we've done over the last year and we're, we're starting to do is to work with our members, doesn't matter what sector, but including construction, including utilities and transport and distribution and disseminate best practice. We've revamped our guidance that we issue to all our members on working at height. And you know, at some stage soon, we'll make all that guidance available free on our website. Um, that is the role that we've got to play. But there is something seriously wrong looking at the statistics which show that the incident, incident rate for fall from heights in transport and distribution and utilities is three times that of construction. Construction stepped up, still a long, long way to go. Uh, however, let's not lose sight of the other sectors. Uh, and the bit I will say, and it might take, get taken out in the edit, uh, how is it a great big venue like the Hammersmith Apollo which regularly has scaffolding up outside because they put the advertising for all the shows up and down, can have scaffolders at work who are throwing down scaffolding tubes from the top and uh, uh, other paraphernalia associated with scaffolding uh, without protection of the public. Um, you know, I think that we mustn't lose sight of those who procure contractors, so there's still some way to go. 
Uh, maybe I'll put that question to the Hammersmith Apollo at some stage. Are they satisfied that the risks uh, posed by those scaffolders and that scaffolding was satisfactorily managed? Because uh, frankly, I don't think it was and I think it was visible. So that's just one example. But I think a hell of a lot of progress has been made, which is tribute to members of uh, AIF and others. But let's not lose sight of the other sectors. Thanks, Neil. Well put. Peter, coming to you. Thank you, Neil. Um, you'll probably not be surprised to hear that um, the Actions Industry Forum and its members, um, we, we've still not found the Holy Grail either, but it doesn't stop us looking for it. Um, from our perspective, uh, we, ob we obviously have a particular interest in addressing the issues of falls from height. And you, you, you'll not be surprised to know that we, we have been working uh, quite consistently over the last period of time since last year when we had this discussion. And we, we've kind of looked at it from the point of view of let's just focus in particular areas. And picking up on some of the themes from the other speakers here, um, we've identified and we've been doing quite a bit of work in addressing the issue of those who manage work at height activities. Um, most of the AIF organisations are uh, a very strong and robust uh, training schemes and competence schemes for those who use the equipment, for those who deliver the uh, work height activities that, that are sort of governed by these bodies. But what, we, what, we, what we've identified is that those who manage working at height activities um, are, are not as skilled and not as competent as perhaps they should be. And, and so you, you have the situation that, that you spoke about, Neil, where yeah, you can look at that uh, activity at the Apollo, was it Apollo, yeah? Uh, and, and you can see that's not right. But what, what we're trying to get to is that should be obvious to everyone who is managing those activities to be able to identify what's good practice, what's bad practice, and be able to intervene when it's appropriate to intervene. Uh, and that is an area that we are certainly working on in respect of putting together a uh, training course, putting together a qualification that will equip managers and will essentially give them the skills and the underpinning uh, knowledge to be able to as I say, identify good practice, bad practice across the work height spectrum. Um, and certainly it's our experience that th that that is lacking at the moment, that, that is not out there. We have, we have some uh, managers who have a little knowledge about that bit of it, a little knowledge about that, and what we want to do is to basically take that across the whole spectrum. Take it from the other end, um, I think, uh, picking up on some of the themes that have uh, been mentioned before, we as an industry and our member organisations do an awful lot and we, we, we think we're doing the right things. The difficulty we've got is at the other end, the recording of incidents, the recording of accidents, our experience is it's very difficult to make any sense of them. It's very difficult to work out whether all of the things or the initiatives or the activities that we're undertaking make any difference because the recording of incidents and accidents is decidedly inconsistent, is about the best way I could put it. That's, that's interesting you raise that, Peter. And, and um, I guess that sort of leads us on to, um, you know, it would be crazy for us to not mention one word that's on the tip of everyone's lips at the moment. It's been mentioned already once or twice so far in this discussion, is that I've lost it. And uh, I think Declan, as you alluded to, one of Luster's recommendations was a review of working at height regulations. Um, I, I just want to open this and you know, feel free whoever wants to answer this, but is Luster good? Is it the right thing to be doing with you know, keeping in focus, working at height specifically here? Is it going to make a difference or is it simply just a vote winner? Who'd like to answer that? Can I, can I come in first? Um, on Lofsted, um, there's a, an immense amount of work to be done. Uh, 26 recommendations, and basically, uh, he has said very, very clearly, and it's been accepted by the government, that the whole of our regulatory framework for health and safety is up for review. So that's uh, the 50 sets of regulations, sorry, 200 sets of regulations, 52 approved codes of practice. That's a massive amount of work, and there have to be priorities. I thought, um, you know, the British Safety Council is a very, very big supporter of Ragnar Lofsted's evidence-based 
approach to his review, the fact that he did research widely and did a very, very job of looking at all the relevant evidence. And he needs to be congratulated like that, because unlike Lord Young, who didn't, uh, I thought, and we think that Lostead had great integrity in the way that he carried it out. I thought in relation to working at heights, the sections of his report on uh, that particular set of regulations was, I think, inconclusive. What he was saying was that there were some commentators, some respondents who submitted views who weren't particularly happy about the regulatory approach of the 2005 regulations. Um, not, you know, the argument, should they be more prescriptive, less prescriptive? You know, should there be an improved code of practice in support? Should the guidance be better? Uh, a whole number of questions. I don't think the working at height regulations, my reading of Losteb was that this is a major problem. These regulations aren't working. I think HSE, by their own research, have shown that in the early days since the regulations were put in place, you know, they are getting traction, they are getting greater awareness, people are far clearer about the duties that they've got. So I think there were one or two questions that Losteb posed about working at heights. But, you know, I don't see it as one of the major areas of work. Yes, in terms of the audience here today and AIF and its members, it is important to get it right. But I, I didn't get a sense that Losteb was saying, let's you know, turn the regulatory regime for working at height, heights upside down. I do think there's a big question, though, about other areas. And I think that there is a good chance the whole number of approved codes of practice will go out the window. I think HSE, us as duty holders and as uh, health and safety organisations, have got to address the central question, what earthly good do approved codes of practice do? Could, they, could we be better served by you know, more of a content going in regulation or guidance? So I think it's a massive piece of the work and um, big questions about has HSE got the resources, capability uh, and time uh, to do uh, what Losted's recommended. So, okay, thank you, Neil. That's me. Roger, did you want to come in here? Well, I concur with, the, with a lot of what uh, Neil has said, um, Lofsted did do a fairly decent evidence-based job, but there are a lot of hanging questions. And um, one of the recommendations he, he's made, which is the most important, which I think will actually get little traction unless ministers put, uh, and the government puts weight behind it, is his call for a national strategy to develop what he calls risk intelligence to develop a more risk intelligent society where we approach problems on the basis of risk and not rules. And I think that's a theme that applies very strongly here when we're working with one of um, uh, humanity's oldest enemies, gravity. Yeah? I, I write a column every month for our magazine. I don't know whether you, if you have sleep problems, I recommend it. <laughs> um, but I've just been drafting a piece uh, on um, and it's related to the question of prevention of falls at work on when do you put up fencing and when don't you put up fencing in public places. I don't know whether you recall there was a, um, last week a coroner's inquiry into a death of a pensioner at the Western Supermare fell over the uh, seafront wall uh, before railings were put up because a councillor said railings were part of health and safety gone mad and then we've had a 350,000 fine £350,000 fine against Merlin Leisure, Warwick Castle, a tragic fall there three years ago. There is actually a very good um, uh, set of guidance being developed by uh, a group, a uh, coordinate, coordinating group on safety in the countryside, who are dealing with this question of when do you fence, when don't you fence. Now, it's not, it's not centrally related to working at height. And in fact, the irony is that if people were at work in these situations, the standard of protection to be provided would be higher than provided for the public. But it does come back to the question of how do you exercise judgment to determine what is reasonably practicable? And that is one of the core questions at the heart of the hierarchy, as you know, in working height regulations. It's one of the core questions in our whole style of health and safety regulation, which Ragnar Lofsted has supported, but the challenge he's, he's thrown out, the thing he's put his finger on, is that you've got to have a much more competent society if you want to operate a risk as, a, as opposed to a rule-based approach to safety. And I think, if we're honest, one of the problems we've faced in this industry dealing with this problem 
is people have wanted to follow rules yeah, and not use good judgment based on assessment of risk. And we've got a huge job to do, particularly educating people to, on how to make judgments in particular situations about what would be too much safety, what would be too li little safety, and in between where the balance is just right. So uh, Lofsted has pointed the way and said, yes, we've had this system in place for 30 odd years based on risk, but we still haven't really created a risk intelligence society and there's more work to be done. Great. Thank you, Roger. Barry, I think you want to come in. Uh, one of the things that uh, Professor Lofsted actually did um, go on to say was that he felt that um, risk should be actually in the curriculum at all levels in education and he actually challenged people to actually go out into schools and um, start discussing risk. That's something that um, we're actually doing. Um, but um, it's interesting, if you actually look at even some of the engineering courses at university, risk is only just beginning to sort of be um, treated as an integral um, part of that. I actually lecture uh, in the School of Architecture at University College London and some of the MSc students there, have a very, when they start, have got a very limited understanding of what risk is, let alone how to actually apply it to their particular um, field of activity. And, you know, we have to start talking to them about definitions of risk. What is it? How do we actually identify threats? And that actually worries me. And I think that's actually a very key um, element of um, Professor Lerstead's report, actually getting uh, people to understand at an early age and to carry on learning more about it, what risk is about. Um, at the moment, it tends to be an add-on. We, we have a, an activity, we actually look at what risks are. People don't think about risk as being an integral part of how they do an activity, and that's where we've got to get to, in my view. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. Gentlemen, it occurs to me, you know, I've been, I've been listening to your opinions and, and it's very interesting and we've heard some interesting words thrown around in terms of evidence and report uh, and facts and things like that. Um, but I guess what, what's in my mind when I'm hearing this sort of thing is when you hear those sort of terms, you, you need to back up behind that objective statistics in terms of that, that sort of terminology, you know, even the fact that Loftus produced a report, if you're going to determine the worthiness of any, any legislation, then surely you've got to come at it from a factual perspective as opposed to any sort of subjective or anecdotal perspective. I, I'm not saying that there wasn't in any of that involved, but we know the issues that surround RIDOR, um, and we know that RIDOR has been moved now to over seven days, which, um, certainly I think from my point of view is, is actually not going to provide the industry any significant greater amount of information available to us as a safety bodies. And drawing on what Peter said earlier, um, the access industry reform have been getting voluntarily information from other organizations now supplying their incident and accident data, is that there clearly are organizations out there who are monitoring their own evidence-based approach to what is going on from, a, uh, from working at height perspective and by the looks of it are from an indicative point of view prepared to share that information for the greater good. But if Peter, what he's saying is that actually the organizations that submit their data so far are all reporting it differently in every aspect, then no matter how great an amount of data we get, if that is if that is a indicator of what is happening in the the UK at the moment, then we are never actually going to get to a factually based approach to if if our end destination is zero working at high accidents, we surely need to know where the point of departure is to set off to that destination. And I guess my my I'm throwing it out on the floor now is we need to step back one from here, go back to base one and say if we want to look at this factually and analytically to be able to channel and to charter a journey to zero working on accidents. We need to get the data that we're getting in 
reported in a, in a consistent way that is forensic in the way that we want it to be able to determine and analyze and differentiate and recommend routes forward because it's clear we're all doing great things in terms of health and safety. It's clear that we could do a lot more by meeting the minds and perhaps as this sort of panel here and the organizations that we have here, we may be in a position to put together a recommended route for reporting incidents and accidents, which we will then put out to industry to voluntarily now work to. Any thoughts on that? An idea? Anyone respond? Roger. I, I can certainly Sorry. agree in, in, with the, the move to seven days. Uh, seven days was adopted because a lot of safety professionals and HR people thought that people made up the absence um, if it wasn't seven days worth and they didn't need to be back at work. And there was some, you, there's some um, suggestion there might be something in that when you look at the difference in three-day rates between very small firms and very big firms. But anyway, by going to seven days, we'll lose about a third of the data, right? But it will also have the effect of further depressing the reporting rates. So uh, the usefulness of RIDOR data as a tool, a diagnostic tool, as you're suggesting, I think will diminish. In our awards, we're going to move next year, we're moving to a totally online system, but we're going to invite entrants to include total LTI figures, yeah, and also other data that they collect. And I think it's the collection of other data about unsafe acts and conditions, particularly in this area related to falls, which are much more important. They're much more important to enable a business to get a feel for whether they're getting on top of these risks. So getting a rigorous approach and encouraging and rewarding people for reporting in a non-punitive way um, cases where edge protection hasn't been inspected or isn't in place or where people are not clipping on or people are nearly having falls and so on mm -hmm. and investigating those incidents. That's the point when it's actually much easier to learn. It's far easier for an organization to uh, do proper in-depth investigation of these things, you know, look, not superficial investigation, just blaming people and, you know, applying random discipline, but looking in depth at what's going on. It's far easier to learn when you've identified an unsafe act or an unsafe condition, which nearly brought you to the cliff edge uh, and a, a fatal or a serious injury. So, so I think if we could get some um, common understandings in place about how to um, re uh, report and analyze unsafe acts and conditions below the below the point of it or before the point of injury that would be uh, an enormous uh, uh, step forward and would be keen to uh, share with <coughs> sorry share with organizations how that could be done brilliant thank you roger neil i think you want to chip in or peter well, sorry well i was going to say from from uh, access industry forum uh, constituent organisations point of view, this is certainly a central plank of what we are trying to say. That we can undertake all of these activities, undertake all these initiatives that we consider are going to make a difference. But at the moment, we, we, we just cannot tell what difference it makes. Because our incident reporting system is such that it's based on text, it's based on, you tell a little story about it, and until we get to the situation where we have a consistent reporting method that takes, if, if we're being serious about it, if we're being serious about falls from height and saying we need to stop it, then we need to treat falls from height differently. We need to say if it's a fall from height, stream it in that direction and ask these specific questions to first of all, if we could even get to the stage where we know what type of work at height activity was this? Was it a ladder? Was it scaffolding? Was it mobile elevating work platforms? We don't even get that. To find that information, they, they undertake data mining. Now, not being impolite, but to me, data mining is they do a word search. They put in ladder. And if ladder comes up in those reports, they say there are 3,000 incidents involving ladders. Now that, that's not necessarily the case. There are 3,000 reports which happen to mention ladder in the report, and it's, and it's not the same thing. We need to get to a situation where we have a consistent and meaningful reporting methodology that 
we use across industry. We, we, we were quite surprised, I have to say, from uh, the forum's point of view, that the work I hate regulations were recommended to be reviewed because our, our contention is and was this is a modern set of regulations, it's goal setting, it is not prescriptive, and it does make people who are working at height think, and it's right that it should do that. But if we do not have, at the other end of it, some way of measuring what difference does it make to what we're doing, then we're going to, have a, we're going to be having these discussions for a few years to exactly, come. Exactly. <laughs> Um, the question that the Access Industry Forum is posing to the five organisations represented on the table here today is how do we work far more collaboratively, how do we work better together to get across the key messages that we need to get across far more effectively so that there's a greater understanding of the awareness that falls from heights pose and the, the damage that they do uh, to individuals and their organisations when they happen and we have you know, we are and we must work far better in terms of getting those key messages out there. And I agree with Peter entirely. The statistics, the evidence base is incredibly important. Uh, we have to know very, very clearly not only what has happened, but why it's happened. And, you know, for that, we are largely dependent, but not solely dependent, on HSE. HSE has got tremendous science and technology capability. You know, they are the main source of the statistics that we need to know what is going on. And, you know, we've got to maintain a dialogue with HSE, work with them, so that we, you know, understand and we're collecting the, de uh, the data, the evidence that we need uh, in order to go forward. But in some ways, I mean, one of the real challenges is that, you know, we're in dialogue with the organisations who get it, who understand it, mm -hmm. who take great pride in being compliant and protecting the health and safety of their workforce and those who they um, engage with their subcontractors. You know, there's an unenlightened end. And that's the real worry, that there's organisations out there who aren't even familiar with the regulations, haven't read the guidance, you know, don't understand about the, the hierarchy of management, um, can't even talk to them about, you know, the concepts of reasonably practicable. Um, if someone like Professor Lovstead, that he said, I have great problems understanding the riddle regulations, what hope is there for the rest of us? Um, we need good quality guidance and if coming together, working with the AIF and its members and uh, the respective industries, we can help improve not only the quality of guidance but also the accessibility of guidance, I think we'll achieve a holy lot. A uh, lot. Not necessarily the holy grail but we will achieve an awful lot. Thank, thank you, Neil. Declan, did you want to come in here? I would certainly, certainly con concur with what Neil has said and one of Roger's points in relation to losing data. Um, when the Ritter regs were put out to consultation, we surveyed members with a view to putting together a response. And uh, one of the comments that came back from several members was that moving from three days to seven days effectively lessens or may be perceived as lessening the importance of accidents that only cause, in inverted commas, only cause three days of lost working time as opposed to seven days. And there was concern that it pushes out the parameters as to what's important and what's significant and what's worthy of reporting. A further point, going back to Lofsted's report, that we would see as an unhelpful and unnecessary recommendation is the exclusion of the self-employed from health and safety laws in the context of their activity being low risk to themselves and other people. That's riddled with uncertainties in relation to interpretation. And I think if we're serious about people, going back to one of Lofsted's other recommendations around the working at height regulations, the substance of the regulations is, is okay and fit for purpose. The issue is over the understanding and interpretation of the regulations. And if we start to marginalize people who are self-employed and create some kind of a perception that they are outside the law, I think that is, and, and the, the feeling within IOSH as a, as a body is that that's a retrograde step towards achieving any kind of a holy grail that we're talking about today. Definitely, definitely. I, I suspect, I mean, we're running out of time, but I suspect pretty much everybody sitting on this panel probably echoes that opinion, I think, in terms of the self-employed. Barry? We've got five organisations here, as you said. We've all got research capabilities. Yeah. Shouldn't we perhaps be trying to pool those? And um, the things we need to address, really, are what data can we get? How do we best gate it consistently? How do we analyse it and against what sort of um, 
uh, KPIs. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's something where we can start. But then obviously there's education. I think, as uh, Peter said, um, and uh, Neil, you've got a lot of organisations there that were just very, very difficult to reach. Yeah. We've got to actually identify how we can reach those as well and how we can get that message out to them. Yeah. So there's a lot to be done, but I think there's a good way of starting it, and that's actually pooling the um, research capabilities Absolutely. and experience yeah. of the organisations we've got I, here. I don't think, um, maybe trying to maybe just chip in and maybe put the words in your mouth, but no one said this was going to be easy, but if we don't know where we're, from, we're starting from, we've got no way of mapping a route to where we're going to get to. So, right. To the forum, um, if you want to see an example of how a very good national database, specialist database uh, on accidents has evolved, uh, you can come and look at the WAID database, that's W-A-I-D, WAID database, which is operated by Rossborough and has been developed over about 10 years t to track every inland water drowning. There are about 400 and then water drownings a year and we uh, convene and service the National Water Safety Forum which brings together all the partners like the Coast Guards and RNLI and RLSS and so on. Um, that is a very good model there if you wanted to look at how that's evolved uh, to develop a unique uh, falls uh, from height database if you wanted to go that route. So there is a you know, rather than reinventing all the wheels, Definitely. Come, and, come and look and see how it's already been done. Definitely. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we've run well over, but I took the decision this was an important topic to cover. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending. I'm sorry we don't have time for questions, but um, I'm sure all of these gentlemen would be happy to um, have a chat with any of you just outside here about any topics that maybe we didn't get to cover today. Um, all of these sessions, including the discussions, are being filmed. They will appear on the Access Industry Forum website in a couple of weeks. And along with that film, where you'll be able to watch it all free again. If there are any questions or comments you think about between now and then that you maybe like to have or contribute to, there will be a full comments area accompanying the videos where you can actually add your comments. And if need be, we can channel these, I'm sure, back into these gentlemen here as well. So again, apologies for running over, but thank you for your time. Thank you to the panel. and. Um, Let's watch out for some developments. Thank you. And what was the outcome of today's discussion? Today's discussion, uh, initially the five member organisations got a chance to express where they have come over the past 12 months and what they have done individually to achieve the uh, holy grail of no accidents involving work at height. What we've gotten from today is an understanding and an agreement that we need to work closer together as organisations and bring about something tangible that we can come back here in 12 months time and say this is what we've achieved collectively as opposed to what we've achieved as five separate member organisations and that's probably a very very important outcome for all concerned. Um, in my view uh, that what we've, that what's come out of this is the general agreement between the organisations to actually work together to develop a better source of data on which we can actually base our decisions for the future. Um, we've got uh, five organisations represented there, <laughs> and, uh, all of whom have got uh, health and safety expertise, all of whom have got research capability, and between us we ought to be able to agree on the sort of data we need to uh, gain is the best way to gain that data from a very varied uh, industry and what we really want to get out of that data how we, so how we need to analyse that um, it's not going to be an easy job uh, but I think with the sort of the skills and knowledge and experience we've got there um, it should be achievable I think it's a really good discussion today what we had is a distillation of a lot of very powerful ideas which if they're brought together will save lives and reduce injuries, particularly impacting on this problem of falls. So uh, I think if you get brains together, if you get data together, you can see solutions that aren't necessarily obvious and things we could do which could apply them would make working life safer, so much safer for so many people. 
it's really great that the Access Industry Forum brought together the various health and safety bodies, including the British Safety Council. For me, the biggest outcome of today was an agreement amongst all those attending to actually work far more closely together to actually tackle the problems surrounding worker heights work at uh, ensuring that the guidance that's available out there is of the highest quality accessible and provides the guidance and advice that duty holders need. I'm, I'm uh, very encouraged and very pleased to say that it looks like uh, the principal organisations in health and safety are at last coming together, having joined up thinking and looking at seriously what we can do to prevent falls from height by acting together instead of separately and, and, and disjointedly.